Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. David Seth Kirshner is the rabbi of Temple Emanuel in Closter, New Jersey. Prior to becoming a congregational rabbi, he worked at the Jewish Theological Seminary, JTS, which he joined in 1999, serving as Senior Director of Institutional Advancement and overseeing the seminary's development and outreach efforts. David has served as president of the New York Board of Rabbis and the New Jersey Board of Rabbis, and he's a member of the Chancellor's Rabbinic Cabinet at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Rabbi Kirshner's articles have been featured in the Jewish Standard, the Times of Israel, the Bergen Record, and the New York Times. He is the author of the book we're gonna talk about today, Streams of Shattered Consciousness, a chronicle of the first 50 days of the Israel-Hamas war, published in December, 2023. Welcome to the broadcast, David. Thank you so much for having me, Abby. It's good to be with you, though it is not good that you had to write this book, I it have isn't. to say. Um, so this is really almost a journal of struggling with the reality post-October 7th on a daily basis. So how did you come to the idea of even starting to put these things down to paper? So October 7th was supposed to be a really special day in my life. It was my 50th birthday. And I was born on the beginning of the Yom Kippur War, October 6th. My mother went into labor and I was born a few hours later. 1973. Early, exactly. So I was really excited to wake up that morning. I saw the news, it was terrible. And I did what most rabbis did. I took all of the energy and rage and frustration and worry and concern and I channeled it into a message to my congregation. And most things that I put out, I put on the Times of Israel blog website. They host a blog for me. And it was helpful to get those feelings out for that day and to channel those emotions. The next day, so many more emotions and feelings rose to the surface. I channeled them, I wrote them, I sent them to the congregation. And each day, I just kept doing that. I did it for about 10 days and I told my kids, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And then the 11th day, I had so much to say and it came out. And they said, well, when are you gonna finish? I said, when my fingers stopped typing. And about day 35, I realized this was bigger than just sharing emotions. People were telling me that they needed help metabolizing, digesting. And um, about d day 35, 36, I realized I wanted to turn this into either the, what was the bones of a book or a book. But I kept it as it was so it could follow the arc of history. I survived September 11th and I was on an airplane that day. My wife was out of her mind. If you remember, all the phones were out. And I thought it was important to be able to dial back to how we felt those hours, those days, those weeks afterwards, because we quickly forget that. Did you have any hesitation about kind of speaking in real time, that in a sense this was so fraught, so intense, that did you feel like what's the filter, who's the editor, or did you just kind of say whatever I'm feeling, I'm going to share? I thought actually that was the secret sauce of it that it was my obligation to be raw and unfiltered because what we were feeling was raw and unfiltered. There were moments that I was angry. There were moments, and I'm not so proud to say this, I, I wanted revenge, like good old fashioned revenge. I don't, I don't gloat in that feeling. But by sharing that, I think it gave license to other people who were feeling similar feelings of confusion, upset, hurt, distrust, vulnerability, solidarity. And I wanted to give that license to people. And that's where I'm proud that it didn't have that filter, that it was raw. You write, I just needed the catharsis. And I was very flattered that people really needed it too. They used it to channel some of their own emotions, to give context to what they were wrestling with. You talked about it being like a pressure valve. And I, I guess I'm wondering, did you get any adverse reaction? Because you obviously got a lot of positive reaction. Was there anyone who, in a way, struggled with your struggles? Look, I'm a congregational rabbi, so I wake up and already 50 people are gunning against me. So, of course, I got adverse reaction. Um, and I got adverse reaction to some of the things that I have written in there and some I got praise for. No matter what stance we take, we're going to receive that. For me, especially after the first seven to ten days, what I realized is I took three to four hours a day to metabolize my thoughts no news, no reading, just ideas that I had jotted down, jotted down and wanted to, to write out. And that was the most sacrosanct part of my day. Those four hours when I was writing, whether it was seven in the morning, whether it was four in the morning, whether it was 10 at night, I really blocked everything else out. And that was my release valve to set off so many of those feelings, emotions, worries, 
and to remind ourselves of these echoes in history that sound so similar from yesterday to today. We have a very short memory, and a lot of this generation doesn't have that same memory. They don't remember Entebbe. They don't remember Munich. They don't remember von Zey. Mm. Um, and there were a lot of echoes of that memory that I think were really important to bring back in. And that was the pressure valve for me that I needed released during this time of high anxiety. You also went to Israel, am I right, four times since October 7th? Since October 7th, and at the end of March, I'm going for my fifth trip. I have two trips back to back. Wow. And so tell me about how those trips informed this chronicle. I said when I went on these trips that I needed to go because my feet needed to be where my heart was. And I felt that since October 7th, my heart was in one place and my feet were in another. I am part of a very Zionistic family. Um, we spend our summers in Israel. Our kids have been to Israel more times than they've been to Florida. They have grandparents live in Florida and we love them very much, but you get the idea. So being there was important. And what I said in the book was that when my brother was diagnosed with cancer, one of the very first things I did was drop everything and go down there. And I did everything from helping with his chores to sitting with him at chemo to just letting him know, you're, you're not going to be alone. And I don't think there was anything I did that he couldn't do. But I think my presence told him, I'm with you, I love you, and you're not by yourself. And that's what being in Israel meant. It meant to the people of Israel, we love you, we're with you, and you're not gonna go through this alone. We stand by your side. And that's why I think so many Israelis were so appreciative to us, which was kind of a winding for us. It caught us off guard, but it was special. And that was what was important. And since then I brought delegations of rabbis, delegations of community leaders, people from our synagogue, because they needed to both be invigorated by the resolve of the people of Israel and also be witnesses to the trauma that many people have denied. You know, after the Holocaust, it took 20 years for Holocaust denialism to rise to the surface. It took 20 minutes after October 7th. And when you bring people to see the atrocities of Kfar Aza with people who survived it and people who lost their loved ones, when they stand at the water cooler, it's very hard to say to them, you're lying. That didn't happen. That's not true. They'll say, I saw it. I'm a witness. So I think being able to bear witness and push back on those falsities is really mission critical to what we're doing. You describe having uh, interfaith meetings with clergy that you are already in relationship with and that there was some fairly disappointing denialism going on in those meetings. Um, I, if you could address as honestly as you're comfortable just what it felt like to hear that and how you handled it. It was one of the most painful and rude awakenings in my entire life, definitely in my rabbinate. Um, we were convened by an elected official of clergy leaders. There were rabbis, pastors, priests, and imams. Only one imam came, and we found out later that the one imam who came was the most liberal and willing to come. That imam refused to shake my hand, refused to take a picture with me or any of the other rabbis, and refused to shake the hand of the elected official who was Jewish. And this was the most liberal. The rest refused to come. To my other pastors and priests who were there, I, I called them out. I shook a finger in their face and said, when Black Lives Matter rose to the surface after the death of George Floyd, I stood shoulder to shoulder with you, as did all of my friends and colleagues in my congregation. And we said, not on my watch. We're marching with you because every life matters and black lives matter. When there was a significant rise in Asian hate during COVID, and we have a very large population of Asian Americans that live in our area of Bergen County. We again said, not on our watch. And here we were in a moment where we had marched at Selma, we had stood up at Stonewall, and here the bombs were falling in Stairot, and I looked to my right and looked to my left, and crickets, there was no one there. And we had felt abandoned before, but Abby, it was the most lonely I've ever felt. The fact that a handful of days into this conflict and already the narrative had changed, the facts were skewed, and no sense of empathy whatsoever for the worst violation that we have gone through since the Holocaust and perhaps even before because the barbarism was unparalleled. It shook me to my core. You know, the other rude awakening in this moment for me was that the shooting in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life Synagogue was Dickens. It was the worst of times and it was the best of times. It was the worst of times because they killed 11 Jews who came to pray and we know what it looks like when white nationalists, white supremacists come to kill Jews. We're familiar with that posture and it hurt a lot. 
but at the same time love him or hate him, the President of the United States came to offer his condolences. The Pittsburgh Steelers came to be honorary pallbearers, the entire team and organization for the Rosenthal brothers who had special needs. They wrote on all their cleats, love over hate. The entire community galvanized around us, regardless of what side of the spectrum they were on, right, left, middle. And everyone was united. The cover of the Pittsburgh Gazette on Friday said in Hebrew letters, Yit Gadal V'Kadash, one of my Pulitzer, by the way. So it was the worst of times, but our empathy and unity was fantastic. And I thought October 7th was going to be like that as well. I thought it was going to be our George Floyd moment, our stop Asian hate moment. And it wasn't. And I think that that was, has been a gut punch to and how all do you, of us. How do you explain it? I know it's complicated, but how do you diagnose it? Diagnose it. Brett Stevens helped me diagnose it, so I don't want to take credit for it. Um, he said, America in general does a good, good job giving empathy to Jewish people, black people, Asian people, when the people responsible for their aggression are white supremacists. But when it's Palestinian militants that are responsible for Jewish, uh, for acts of aggression against Jews, it gets very muddy and complicated to oppressor, oppressee, who's the real white, innocent, privileged victim here. Um, and I think that complication has led people to a binary choice. That's ridiculous. We can hold two truths. The great irony is that we have been trained in this movement to accept people who are non-binary. But we, the very same people who are training us to accept non-binary people are telling us, in order to be progressive, you must be anti-Israel, which is a binary choice, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous. And it's hypocritical. And it's against the very values that we're part of. Just to go back to the sense of betrayal that you, you touch on in the book yeah. very powerfully, you say, as tragedy has now befallen my people, I have taken attendance at who is part of the marchers and the chorus. Just as a rabbi, that's kind of an admission that's strong. You're basically saying, like, I'm kind of taking names here, I'm remembering. Um, can you just address sort of the, the pastoral approach to betrayal, like how do you, are you forgiving in your heart? On the Friday after Pittsburgh, a couple came in and I normally walk, it's a smaller service for us, 60 people, so not very, our big service Saturday morning. And a couple came in I didn't know and I walk around and slap backs and kiss babies on Fridays, that's what I usually do. And I walk over to this family and say, hey, I'm, I'm David, welcome. They said, we're the O'Malley's, we're not Jewish, we live in a town next door, but we needed to be with you tonight. And that was my first cry after Pittsburgh. And I hugged them tight and I spoke about them the next day and it, it stirred my soul. And I was looking for that on the Saturday after October 7th. On October 14th, I was looking for that. It wasn't there. Our people came, but others didn't. And I wrestled a lot, and I still do, Abby. I wrestle with, well, what's gonna happen? Not if, but when the next black man who's unarmed is killed by a white person or a white police officer whether it's Trayvon Martin or George Floyd, what's gonna happen when society demands us to march? And I've come to the conclusion, I'm gonna march. I'm gonna march loudly and proudly. But what hurts my soul is that the people on my right and my left who I'm marching with, it looks like we're on the same page morally and ethically, but we're not because there's a double standard they're holding for people who are Jewish. And that's painful. You wrote, my advocacy is not to curry favor or earn chits. My marching and chanting are because of my moral compass and values. The reason I am often surrounded in those moments by fellow Jews is because we share those values and our compasses are aligned. It is core to our canon and part of our genes. I guess I would ask you to kind of help some of us as a rabbi, and we are your proverbial congregation, that for many, to get over the, se the sense of crickets, as you've said, and to just even something so basic as even the sexual atrocities and the silence around those. Uh, is forgiveness the question? I mean, is, is that the sort of the, the thing we should be striving for? Is, is it a sense of staying true to who you are as a human being and what you believe and stand for, even if it is not reciprocated? I mean, just Jewishly, help us navigate that. Look, it, it's tricky, it's not a straight line, and we have a hard time with jagged lines. So let me tell you what, what bothered me, and then let me tell you what I think the options are. So let's, let's take it away from the synagogue. When 
Kids were holed up at Cornell University and they were afraid to go to the kosher dining hall or to the library because they were Jewish. This is recently. This was recently in the wake of October right. 7th where they said, if we see a Jew pig, let's throw him off the cliff or let's kill them. These were actual phrases that were said by ironically an Asian American student who was um, at Cornell. What I had wanted in that moment was for someone who wasn't Jewish to knock on the door and to say, I'm going to the dining hall. Walk with me. Walk with me. If they're going to hurt you, they're going to hurt me too. Stand next. I'm going to stand with you. Right? I want you to know we'll walk together. And as far as I know, those knocks on the door didn't happen. Those are the crickets that have hurt my soul. They have hurt in a significant way. Do I think we have the power to forgive? Absolutely. Do I think that that level of tshuva has happened yet? It hasn't. It hasn't because people are not able to hold two truths. That's been a, a, a major disconnect for people. When I, I do this exercise in my synagogue, I say, if you love your spouse more than you did when you married them, raise your hand. And almost every single hand in the congregation goes up. And then I say, if your spouse is the one person that can drive you the most bonkers, push all your buttons more than anyone else, raise your hand. And they all giggle like you are, and they raise their hand. And it's not, it's not hard for us to digest that because we're in relationship and we know those two truths. We know that we love our partners more than we did when we first met them and we love them a lot then, but we also know that they have our number sometimes. Those two truths on paper aren't parallel whatsoever, but in reality, it works. People in reality should be able to say that they hold progressive views, they stand for things that matter, and Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has a right to preserve sacred life of every Gazan and Palestinian, but at the same time to eradicate Hamas. Those two truths can be held equally together. But for some reason or another, society is saying, no, for Israel to exist, it must go away. Or for, for Israel to take out the Palestinians means that they only will kill civilians and that won't stand. I don't think that's fair. The second question you're asking, which I think is, is really interesting that I dive into in the book, is why has there been this denialism? The denialism about sexual um, horrible crimes that happened to women in Israel on October the 7th. And I think a denialism is ripping down all of these kidnap signs. And I'm convinced that's because we are in a race to the bottom. That between the Jews and the Palestinians, we're racing to see who can be the bigger victim. And if there's a sign up that says a five-year-old boy was taken hostage away from his father and his mother was killed in front of his eyes and he's being held captive in Gaza, what makes you more of a victim than that? So in, in an effort to not have to validate that victimhood, there are people ripping it down and denying it because if we admit it, well then they're entitled to victimhood and we don't want to give Jews victimhood. We don't want to give Israelis victimhood because the real victim here are the Palestinians. So the best way to deny that is to rip it down. And that's what I think is happening. Let's deny it and we'll rip it down and then we can own the mantle of victimhood. And my argument is not complicated. It's those two truths. It's yes, the Jewish people are indeed victims. We're victims of October the 7th and we're victims throughout history. You don't have to dig very deep to see where and how. But at the same time, the Palestinian people have been victims too. Right now they're victims to Hamas, they've been victims to a, a crooked and corrupt government, and they're victims to people who care more about their victimhood than they do about their future. So you uh, finished this book after 50 days. I mean, you decided at least to stop. The war is not finished. We're, I think, day 160 now. It's some huge number that we're speaking. Um, in terms of the Palestinian loss of life, let's put aside the actual number, because I know there's dispute about where those numbers are coming from. It's very large that we can agree on. It's tragic. Agreed. The humanitarian crisis is unspeakable. No question. So how now in this place, as you process that aspect, knowing as I know you believe that Israel has to continue in terms of eradicating Hamas, how do you talk to your congregants about that, if I can ask you? Of course, I think you're asking a really important question, and this is the difference between a butcher and a surgeon. I believe Israel has a responsibility to eradicate Hamas. They have that responsibility so that every person can return to their home and put their head on a soft pillow. I think at the same time, Israel has the exact same responsibility, where and when and how it can, to preserve every innocent life in Gaza, its own innocent lives of Israelis and of Gazan and Palestinian people. That's not an easy order. 
Right? That, that is a really difficult responsibility. Even more difficult when those who are responsible for these heinous crimes hide behind children and women and innocent people or in places like hospitals. That puts the, the task at a very significant one. And I don't think those two things are exclusive of each other. I think we can do both, and I think we should hold Israel to being able to do both. But we should not hold Israel to either or. We should not say we either eradicate Hamas, Hamas or we only care about the innocent Palestinian people, but we aim to do the best we can in both. We must eradicate this evil regime, but we also must be sensitive to the humanitarian plight. And I think that you know, the interesting thing about these sophisticated topics, much like the loving the person more and they having your number, is most people don't find it so complicated when you break it down. It's not that complicated to say we're going to eradicate Hamas and we're going to preserve human life however we can because it values it and we value it. I think the only difference is, is that when I see the loss of those lives, I don't blame the Israeli military as fast as I blame Hamas. If the military makes a mistake, I'll call them out on it. And they've owned it. When they shot their own, those three hostages that came out, they've had to own that. But my fault line on this, my responsibility, my finger wagging is squarely in the face of Hamas and the people who continue to support them that are subjecting their people to this reality. And when you hear a disbelief, uh, the, a questioning of whether the IDF really is trying to protect innocent lives as much as possible, because you know that that's out there. Uh, how do you respond to that? There's, there's no question in my mind, because I've spent an inordinate amount of time my whole life with soldiers and Israeli military leadership, and especially soldiers that are involved in this battle. War is hell. And we're asking people to thread a needle while there's gunfire coming in all directions and have to make split-second decisions. I think that they are making human life one of the most important responsibilities that they're trying to accomplish. Does it mean that they're having a perfect success rate? Absolutely not. Are innocent people dying? Absolutely. Do I mourn those losses? No question. Do I think the IDF mourns those losses? Absolutely. I think the issue at hand is not whether or not those are real losses. To me, they are. I think the IDF thinks they are too. It's who's responsible for those losses. I put that responsibility squarely on the shoulders of Hamas, where others put it squarely on the shoulders of the IDF. I don't think that's fair. You uh, dedicated part of your book or your acknowledgments to your wife, Dory, whom I am lucky enough to, to know a little bit. And I just want to read what you wrote. Uh, my wife, my best friend, the love of my life, most importantly, my partner in planting that same seed of Zionism in the two gifts of life we have been blessed to call ours, your children. I guess I want to ask you how you planted that seed of Zionism in your kids. I have so many um, parents ask me, how does one do this? And particularly now. Um, if you retrace your steps, how do you think you managed it? Well, um, I'm, I'm one of those people that will proudly admit that I overmarried in life. Um, and uh, I really, I wake up almost every day looking over and be like, is this real? Did she really choose to live with me? I, I, I can't explain it. Um, I think what makes our love story so remarkable is that the things that really matter the most to us, we are shoulder to shoulder on. The little stuff we might quibble over. But when it comes to issues of family, when it comes to issues of values, we're together. And part of our values is that our main religion in our house is Zionism. What that means is we might celebrate Shabbat differently and all of our kids might have a different angle for how they're gonna do that. But the one thing we're gonna be unwavering on is that the Jewish people have a right and determination to a state and sovereignty. But built into that are Jewish values, which means we can't deny other people's right to self-determination and sovereignty as well. We have taken at least 15 years of summers in Israel with our kids. We have hosted people from Israel in our home. And over summers, our kids have gone to Zionistic camps more than they've gone to conservative or reform camps. That's how they identify. And we've taught them not that they have to believe a particular way, not that they have to follow the teachings of Jabotinsky or Meir or Ben-Gurion, but that we want to put the challenges in front of them of what it means to be a good Zionist, and we want them to wrestle with it. We want them to chew on it. We want them to struggle with it. Because Jabotinsky and Echad Am struggled with it, and Ben-Gurion struggled with it, and Rabin struggled with it, and Barak struggled with it, and they're struggling with it today. And that being a good Zionist doesn't mean we have the answers. It means that we're part of the tussle. So 
Dory has been my partner in putting that meat in front of our kids to wrestle on, to tussle with, to struggle with, and to move with. So they're in a dynamic relationship with their Zionism, but that's part of the beauty of what Zionism is. So finally, David, uh, it's a powerful book. It's a hard book to relive, to read, because it's vivid, because you were writing in real time. How do you hope people use this? How do you hope people uh, return to it? I hope that it reminds people of a few things, that they're allowed to have had different feelings. But most importantly, I hope it allows them to digest and metabolize the arc of that trajectory and to grow, to realize that sometimes our worst moments cultivate what will become the most important moments in time. Uh, we went to Yosemite one year, and there was a great tour guide who taught us that forest fires, as terrible as they are, are one of the very best things for the regeneration of trees that can't grow otherwise, but only through the heat that is generated and popping the seeds that comes from a fire. I'm hopeful that through reading this book and seeing opportunity, that what can happen through the Abraham Accords, what can happen with possibility, friendship, what can happen with grassroots leadership will bring about Zionism 2.0 and leadership 2.0 that will bring a real redemption of what is the Jewish state, one that can live side by side with its neighbors in peace. It sounds very Pollyannish, but if I stop believing that, we're in big trouble. David Seth Kirshner, thank you for this book. It is called Streams of Shattered Consciousness, a chronicle of the first 50 days of the Israel-Hamas war. This has been In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. See you next time.